This is uh, wonderful to uh, come here and start the academic year off. Uh, this is my ninth time doing this, and I really appreciate the, the opportunity of sharing now maybe a, a look ahead, as well as uh, maybe some recognitions of some of the challenges we have and how we're going to solve some of those challenges over this year or the, in the years ahead. Um, first off, I uh, want to recognize the fact that we have uh, some board representation here. K.P. Walters is in the back. And also Donna Brooks, our honorary life member, is here as well. So please recognize them. We also have the uh, faculty senate chair, Karen Gibson, and also the student senate president, Andrew Plague, and some of his uh, uh, staff as well. So just wave if you can. OK. OK, and I appreciate uh, being with, uh, with our colleagues. And uh, uh, also, uh, I'm going to go in and out of the uh, uh, podium and the script a little bit. But I want to stay pretty much to my themes that I want to uh, discuss with you today. But we're here with colleagues and uh, Marcia, too. And I appreciate her coming and the great support I get from her. Thank you for that. Um, last night, we were at 801. That's the residence that uh, the president is uh, very privileged to, uh, to live in. And we were there with uh, two of our children. And we were thinking, and I was thinking about how privileged and, and blessed we were because uh, uh, these two children are going to be moving within the same neighborhood called Chicago from DC. And that, that's fine. That's good because uh, we do have uh, children who are out and about in the world. And um, so we're pleased with that. But what I was thinking about last night in our conversations uh, about the, them and about a conference that I attended earlier in the day about millennials, and they are the typical millennials. They, they will pick up and go, and that's what our students are all about. They, they're gonna, but they came here this year and come back this year as well to Grand Valley State University because I believe that we are fulfilling the promises that we made to them. Well, I'm thinking there, again, listening to their conversations, the excitement of about new adventures and transitions. We're going to talk about that at Convocation here in a second, aren't we? With uh, probably a record number of freshmen this year. Isn't that wonderful to hear that? <laughs> but Marsha and I feel very, very uh, privileged, and um, we feel blessed in many regards to then come after that reflection last night I had to come here this morning to start another academic year uh, with you. And you know, we do have a special place. As, as uh, our athletic uh, director says time and again, uh, it's all about our school. And therefore, it's all about us. It's all about our students and all about the impact that we're going to be making. So you're also going to hear today uh, some uh, words that I think I'm going to use for the guideposts as we lead to 2021. And you'll hear why I'm focusing in on uh, 2021 with our strategic planning. But, uh, you know, in, in less than two hours, we are going to meet the, those uh, new freshmen who have chosen us, those first-year students. But we also have uh, students uh, that are new to campus, that are um, Coming, coming from community colleges, uh, students uh, coming from the services, students coming to uh, enroll in some of our wonderful graduate programs. We have a very diverse student population when it comes to the, the array of programming uh, that we have. But I do know this. Uh, these uh, young people are motivated, they're ambitious, and um, we must be ready for them and for future students that are going to be coming to Grand Valley State University. And so the, the answer of this question will be, hopefully in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes, will be answered. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Uh, as, as you know, our mission is very clear, shaping student lives, professions, and society. And when, when you say that, it seems pretty simple. But as you know, and I know, that the details themselves get very, very complex. So what I'm going to out, uh, do for you today is outlining some of the key strategies that I see that we remain relevant and vibrant for the decades ahead. 
That word relevant, you heard from me time and again and again, and I still think it resonates as we look ahead to these next decades ahead. So what I want to talk to you about today is Michigan relevance, global impact. Just think about that right now. Those are, those are guideposts as we look ahead to 2021. Michigan relevant, global impact. That's what we are all about here. It kind of uh, summarizes the uh, outcome that we want as an institution, it summarizes our mission. Michigan relevant, global impact. We'll discuss, and some of you have heard this, some of you not, but I want to uh, hit upon it, a new initiative by the provost that will affect the disciplines across the entire academic sphere, and then some enrollment challenges, and why we must stay student-focused. We must. And how each of us in here, and those that aren't here, because we will, in fact, share this message with our other colleagues that aren't able to come here, uh, how we must play a role in the future of Grand Valley State University. But let's take a moment to celebrate first. And, and this is the right time to do it. You know, we're best in class. The governor said that, the legislators said that, and they did it because of our performance, because of you all. We are best in class. And we are recognized for the first time in probably, Matt, 13 years with an uptick in our state appropriation. And what we're able to do now is strategically invest that. Students first, as you'll hear in a minute, but I think best in class is not a bad place to be, is it, ladies and gentlemen? So I, meant, I mentioned the governor, and you know he's a numbers guy. He likes these dashboards. Well, we've been doing da dashboards uh, here ever since I came here, because I like numbers as well. Chick knows that. Okay, so does Philip, because I ask him for all the numbers. But uh, there was a, this new funding model dealing with performance metrics. It deals with retention, graduation rates, low administrative cost, the number of Pell eligible students are just a few of the factors that go into state appropriations. Now, even though the number of dollars might be low, getting almost 10% plus up this past year recognizes your efforts, the faculty and staff efforts in, in fulfilling that mission and our promises to our students. And Therefore, rewards come because of your uh, hard work. Now, here's the, uh, one of the outcomes that I like to report back, and this uh, hopefully will, will see itself beyond uh, just the Grand Valley today, but all this effort, I said we were strategically focused on students with some of these uh, additional dollars, and I promised the board, and I promised students, and I promised legislators, that we would then have students first, and we did. Because of this, we were able to keep our rate of uh, increase and the dollar amount to the lowest amount in the last decade. And here's, here's the real catch on this. Um, because of that improving uh, support from the state and the donor support that we get, Karen, and, and many, I, I think we're at 58% of uh, those faculty and staff giving to the campaign, giving back to our students. Because of that, ladies and gentlemen, our net tuition this year is lower than last year. Can you imagine that? First time in our history that's ever happened. <laughs> and that is why we keep access and affordability there, and then we want to get them through, as we'll point out here in a few minutes. Um, and the other thing, too, this is uh, quite important because it is a performance metric. Um, of the 15 public institutions here in Michigan, there's just three institutions that have graduation rates above the national average. That's not so good news in some regards, but there's three institutions, Grand Valley, U of M, MSU. So we're in pretty good company. But as you will point out in a second, there's a lot to do with that. I need to share this with you because I think it uh, reflects well. Bridge Magazine uh, published an analysis of, of these grad rates and said this, quote, if Michigan wants to get more degrees in the hands of students in less time, college leaders should study what's happened in Allendale. <laughs> so the results are there. They truly are. It's great to see that. 
So as I say, Michigan relevant indeed, don't you think? Well, we're a ma major player in Michigan and across the nation now too, but it really is not time to take a pause. This is really a time now that we can use our entrepreneurial spirit and flexible strengths. Let's, we, let's get creative. Let's remain laser focused on student experiences, results, and success. I think Nancy G uh, uh, resonates with that day in and day out, and I think we all do when we think about student success. Well, one of the examples that's coming through, uh, through the startup meetings in colleges was one where uh, Gail, uh, had uh, introduced an exciting initiative on, on campus. I want to repeat this a little bit. And as you know, now she's starting her 13th year. Isn't that great? Let's, let's say it. <laughs> and she continues to be dedicated to exposing our students some of the leading edge uh, concepts and technologies and the opportunities to help students after commencement, when they enter the workforce, or go into graduate schools. And she asked this, I'm gonna quote you. Quote, how can Grand Valley stay distinctive so we can keep attracting the best and the brightest? And turn out graduates who are way ahead of the competition and bringing value to their potential employers and to their communities. And so she has started this initiative, and again, some of you have heard, some maybe not, but the answer to this has very deep roots in our own DNA here in West Michigan. And that cutting edge really is in, in design and design thinking. Not just a buzzword per se, but we're gonna invest in this because it's going to differentiate our students in the workplace. And then as they go into graduate school, because we know many of them do go into a lifelong learning model, but you'll hear much about this in the weeks and months ahead because it really is going to be one of those opportunities within our strategic plan, within the work this year, to look at our culture. That's so important. So, but let me define it the way I see it, Gail. This is my, my interpretation as I see it. It really is a, it's a system, which I like to look at. As a chemist, I like to see those systems when I deal and, and design my uh, chemistry, my chemical reactions, and the mechanisms for that matter. It's a system of collaborative planning and problem solving. I like that word too, collaborative, because it does take all of us across the various disciplines. And of course, you know that Gail brought that whole distinctive uh, flavor of interdisciplinary studies right here. This is another outcome of that type of thinking. And what we do is we, we are looking at the planning and problem solving uh, and the consideration of, of uh, people who are impacted by a central problem. Now, I'm saying that because I mentioned that we were with our uh, son-in-law and daughter last night. Our daughter moved from a very stable position now working with a startup company in Houston, Texas. She can work from home. Again, a typical millennial. And what she is doing is what's called root cause analysis. She's an engineer, and she's doing the same thing, Gail. I, I, I discovered that last night after talking with her. It's design thinking is what she's doing, too. And we want to make sure that we can position our students just like that. So we're going to be able to partner with many outside organizations, and we're going to serve the needs of this community without doubt. So. I do know that there's gonna be an additional advantage to this. We're gonna be able to attract more resources to the university as well. And that's always good to hear. So this is gonna be uh, an opportunity to look at our curriculum and our co-curricular opportunities. We have uh, one of the leading experts uh, in the nation, John Berry, gonna join us. So John, thank you for taking on this uh, challenge, working with all of us, so I appreciate that. But it is gonna make an impact primarily on students. And, and, the, and, and being this uh, flexibility, entrepreneurial type of institution, I just want to report one more that we took last year. And this is where I, I need to applaud uh, faculty governance. We, in, in a year, we were able to conceive, put through governance, and now implement an executive MBA medically oriented to Spectrum Health, which came to us to help solve their needs to develop their talent. Now, that's what Grand Valley is all about. We're going to solve the needs and we're gonna to respond to our communities just like that. And governance was one that helped us make sure that it was a quality offering and that we were able to persist. And now we might have uh, models. And Shri, you, you and others did a, a fantastic job on that. I'm really pleased with that, sir. Thank you.
Well, let's talk about global impact, one of my favorite topics. And uh, as you remember, when I came here, in my first uh, comments about uh, the university, in my, in my inaugural address, I talked about uh, the global environment in which our students are going to be working and living and, and attracting great faculty and staff from across the uh, globe as well. I do know that Mark Shaw picked up and stood up really proudly when they talked about that. But, you, you know, students uh, with his leadership and others in the um, Padness uh, International Center are studying abroad, as we know, and we have students, international students, uh, coming here and we have uh, celebrations of uh, some long-standing partnerships. For instance, 25 years with, the, with Kingston University, or now this next year, I think it's 40 years with Krakow. And we have others too, but what Mark does is that he focuses in on where are we gonna get the best return for our students and for the faculty and staff who are gonna uh, exchange with one another. And we've seen some results of that too because we lead the pack, ladies and gentlemen, with the number of Fulbrights at schools like us. First in the nation in that number. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and in terms of uh, getting validation, the Institute of International Education grant, uh, ranks Grand Valley as number five in the nation in the number of students study abroad. And Mark has brought creativity and innovation to that, that study. And I think uh, we might see more than 400 international students on this campus. And last year, I think they represented over 80 countries, too. That's providing a healthy and wealthy learning environment for all of us, don't you think? Well, the ESL Language Center has moved to Asabel Hall. Frankly, Asabel Hall was not very good. <laughs> but now it is. So we have a partnership. We get more international students on the campus. We uh, are able to uh, provide them some smaller classroom spaces so they, they can carry out their mission. And maybe these students are going to matriculate right on over to us. Hopefully, check. That would be great, wouldn't it? Okay. And then we got some new classrooms as a result of that. Asabel is really a cool place now. It's right up against the ravines. So I, I, I like that partnership. And uh, there, there was, uh, you know, Jim Bachmeyer loves the fact that someone else is helping to pay for it. <laughs> Makes sense. It really does. So, um, and of course, um, this whole effort in uh, the global educational piece is one that I want to resonate with time and again and again with you. And I was really pleased with uh, the university raising its hand. We were part of the American Council on Education Internationalization Lab, and we created a task force that was headed up by, by Mark and Carol Sanchez. And, and here's where I think we're going on this as well. A great initiative, global impact. Uh, there's, there's gonna be a global Grand Valley team that will articulate to each college and academic programs about the expectations of advancing global learning. Uh, and we know that the students are not going to elect majors that are, say, very, very rich in gl lear global learning goals, but I think there's an expectation that within gen ed there should be that, and um, especially in the cultural uh, course, and then uh, that we have at least one of the goals in every major that there's some connectivity with our students in that major, in that discipline, with the world in which they're going to either continue their learning or go into... Uh, into a uh, profession that is, in fact, global. In fact, think about this city for a second. Um, we, we think about Grand Rapids the way we do, but I think Grand Rapids is becoming a global city. It truly is. You think about the companies that are here. Um, last night, as I mentioned, I was at Wolverine Worldwide, and we had the millennials there, and uh, they are. It's worldwide. We think of the other, other uh, institutions around here, but we are now becoming more and more global-like as a destination. And that could be in a variety of the industries that are here, and in, in particular with the health professions where we're really um, making great investments as well. The health professions in nursing, um, many, many students are attracted there because they're very relevant for their future. And so let me uh, just share this one quote with you. Because uh, when I, I believe when, when you have globally educated uh, students, they're gonna be uh, better equipped, without a doubt, to promote diversity and global responsibilities and inclusion and equity. So Nelson Mandela, uh, Mel Mandela reminded us, quote, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Well, we all, 
faculty, staff, those in the advisory committees that help us, the foundation members, members, the leaders in the, in the community, you teach them, you discover with them, and our students will, in fact, change the world. And as technology makes the world small, and we're going to embrace that without a doubt, our students' global impact then will be even greater. Well, now let's turn to some nuts and bolts of the business of operating Grand Valley State University. Got to have some of this. And I'm going to start out this way. You know, we talk about our facilities, and we do. And we're very, very proud of them. We're proud of the people who envisioned them along the way and, and, and continue to uh, uh, maintain the facilities as, as we see, creating new learning environments, all programmatically driven. Uh, Jim and Gail and the rest of us on the SMT uh, always take that focus as we focus in our, on our facilities. But this really is important because uh, it, it's helping us attract a decreasing pool of high school graduates. That's important, okay, because we have to know that that challenge is ahead. And, and Jim knows my comment time and again, so is James Moyer and, and uh, Tim Timish, that million dollar step on our campus, because every student that comes here is worth probably about a million dollars to us in the long term, because I want them to give at the end of the day. Okay, right Karen? Likers for a lifetime. But, but just think about that, we do have to maintain and continue to be relevant in terms of our, our facilities. Um, and of course, we have to attract that smaller, our, our, our share of that uh, diminishing pool of freshman students. And then we'll look at the other dynamics uh, with regards to service, uh, non-traditional students, and the whole uh, array of students that are, are coming here, graduate students and the like. But I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, I need to, to say this because uh, if you hadn't seen it, you got to turn to it. Go to Wood TV a couple of days ago, Vice Provost uh, Chick Blue, along with uh, Matt McLogan and Mary Leonine, offered a story to Wood TV and, and they took it up. And the sum of the piece was Grand Valley is a brain gain. That's what you said, okay? And, and we are. And we are a brain gain for West Michigan and for the entire state of Michigan because our retention rate now is just a skosh under, that's a chemistry term, 71%. Ladies and gentlemen, that's remarkable because when I came here, it was in the 50s, thereabouts, and, and now these eight plus years, because of your efforts, because of your efforts, faculty and staff, we are again fulfilling the promises to our students. And they are staying here because we are doing that. And I, again, am so thrilled that we have a faculty and staff, and those around the community, our donor community, the foundation members, and others that are so laser focused on student success. And that's just one measure, okay? And three quarters of them are staying right here in Michigan. Bill Seidman and others, Bob Pugh, and you, you think about those founders. They're probably looking down and saying, wow, we done good. But they had the vision, didn't they? And then they, they, then they uh, hired some great people along the way. Jim Zumberg, Don Lovers, Mark Murray, I hope me. But, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, really remarkable. So I think they would be pleased, without a doubt. But let, let me turn this around a little bit. But Chick also has a watchful eye on trends and demographics. And I'm glad she does, and so does her staff with uh, Chick and, 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 uh, and others over there, Cheryl and Michelle. And she, she's sharing this news. And some of it may be, in some regards, some grim news because uh, there's been a very important study that just came out that uh, with regards to uh, graduates, and there just aren't that many of them. And that trend is going to continue down, right, Chick, over these next uh, few years uh, until the next boom, I guess, or boomlet, but I don't see that in the, in, the, in the future. But the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education report predicts that in 2019, 2020, academic year, high school grads in Michigan alone will fall by 20%. That's not far away. It's going to be below 99,000. 
and we're attracting maybe, uh, matriculating this year, maybe about 4,200. Wow. We better pay attention, don't you think, Chick? Don't you think we all should be paying attention, uh, attention on it? Because that decline may uh, continue to go down in the, in the slope that we, we see right now. So I think in order to maintain that, the, that number that we have of first-year uh, students, that are coming to the campus, and especially with the academic profile they have. I don't, don't want to miss out on that. It's not about just the numbers, but we want to attract really good students academically who are going to be up for the challenge that they're going to have in the classroom and in the co-curricular activities, in the clinicals, in the internships, and the like. We need to keep the rigor to our program because that's what they expect. After all, they were high flyers in high school, maybe some transferring from community colleges. Maybe coming to grad school. They're high flyers. For, you know, what is it? I think uh, 48 students uh, out of 525 in, in the PT program. They're high flyers. I think our, we, I'll say this, I don't know this for a fact, but if it's a profile like last year, we'll probably be number three in the state in terms of academic profile, just behind Tech in Michigan, with uh, probably, what do you think, uh, 3 6, 26, or something like that? Probably. But it's not too bad. What do you mean not too bad? That's pretty darn good. <laughs> okay? So I, I think we, uh, we have to continue to pay attention because it's that market share that will continue to the mission as well. So we have to make sure that we stay on track, stay on course. We have to navigate that world. I love it when I can talk Coast Guard. <laughs> but this is our niche position. And you know why? This is, I, I love this too. We are student-centered. Our new mission statement flipped it around. Julie and others flipped it around student-centered, student success, student-centered. That's what it's about. It's our niche. And I always hear this from alums, too. Are you changing the culture? Are, are we different now than we were 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago? Well, 50 years ago, we didn't have any alums. But, but we're, but we're getting close. First graduates in 67. But just think about that. Hmm. Are we too different? No, I, I say we're not because we still maintain those relationships that are so important to our students to, and to each other. That's that, I, I call that really, in a way, it's an intimacy. That relationship helps sustain us, helps sustain our students and keep them on track. That's, that's what it's about. That's our niche. And let, let's continue to... Uh, uh, provide that personal attention to each one of our students and care about them. It's not going to change what we do day to day because we're doing it now, but we can't lose sight of that as well. That's our values. And yet, even with that number of 70% on retention, I still think we need to do a better job retaining students who do enroll. We must continue to stay the course. We have to find ways to even enhance those relationships communications and the like. So we, I think we must continue to do the job of, of retaining those students. And, and this year, we, we, we're doing a little bit better. We were uh, kind of going down a little bit, though. Right, Gail? I think we were. Now, now we may be going back up, and that's good. That's because of all your work and effort, too, faculty and staff together. And we must, uh, I think, continue to entice students who may not want to pursue a degree or at Grand Valley except for the experiences that they have here, too. It's just not, you know, I'm going to come in here to, to study chemistry, even though it's good. Um, but I want the experiences a, of an undergraduate. So, you know, uh, Bart, we've we got to continue to make sure that those, those experiences are also as relevant as we can make them for them. Keep them here on Saturday night and Friday night and maybe even Thursday night. But the other parts to this, of course, making it relevant, includes, again, outside the classroom. This is where you all come into, uh, into being. Um, we have to be very intentional on our internship programs, our clinicals, our teacher training, and other experiential uh, opportunities. Because, frankly, they are the key to our reputation with businesses and communities. They really are, OK? That's critically important. And so, in a way, you know, we're all recruiters, and everyone here has a hand then in retention. Well, where else do we have a hand? 
Well, the reality is, is that we all are ambassadors using uh, Karen's uh, phrase and in her, her staff. I was with uh, her staff uh, earlier in the week. And again, it's all about relationships. It truly is. And um, I'm also uh, pleased uh, when I mentioned uh, uh, that we had um, Donna Brooks here. She's also the vice chair of the foundation. That's an important group to us because they're the leaders, they're the ambassadors. But we all have to help them too because we are ambassadors in our own right too. And so it is about relationships with the students and then in turn when they're alums. I, I, I was so thrilled that we had the biennial conference here for chemical education. Four of my students stopped, stopped by to say hi. They're, in, they're into uh, teaching, research and the like. You know how rewarding that was? They give me a call. Hey, Tom, or Dr. Haas, or Dean. They didn't know T. Haas at the time. <laughs> OK? But now they do. So, but it, it was wonderful to hear and see them and see what they're doing, making their global impact in many ways. Some teaching, some doing other things in the Coast Guard and out of the Coast Guard, too. My legacy there. But it was, it was really neat. So I think that, and Laker for a lifetime is just not a slogan. I, I'm, I'm hearing it uh, with alums. And believe this, we're going to have 100,000 alums in April. 100,000 alums. 50 years ago, we didn't have any. And you know what's also remarkable? I figured this out, Karen. Half of them graduated in the last 10 years. We have a very, very, very young alumni base. But we have to engage them right now. It's going to be a 25-year process. But we will. We are going to continue the pathway that uh, Karen and her staff have embarked upon. Laker for a lifetime. And that's, that's great. In fact, um, uh, one of the uh, things that I mentioned early on, we, we do lead uh, the nation in the number of uh, donors we have just from our faculty and staff, too. We lead the nation on that. So now we, what we have to do is um, also understand this. Yes, we might have 100,000 alums. Here's the challenge. Only 6,000 of them give to the university. Only 6,000. Can you imagine if we had the others give a buck? How many scholarships we could have? How about 10 bucks? How about 100 over a year? That could be a wow. But we have to start in our classrooms, in the experiential learning opportunities, in the co-curricular activities, engaging with them. That's our job. We're ambassadors. And then telling the story to our donor community, to those in the West Michigan area. Tell the story nationally and internationally. Michigan relevant, global impact. So you may not be directly involved in fundraising yet. But I do know that uh, you're involved with relationship building and friendship building. It's friend raising in the truest sense of the word. And you can help me. You can help Karen. You can help our students and alums because you are out there telling the story of Grand Valley. And of course, uh, I did talk a little bit about facilities, but let, you know, we, we are represented in this physical space. And we, we've gotten a huge boost uh, from the bricks and sticks that we, that we do have. And I, I never really tire of about talking about the beauty and the functionality of our campus. I just love our artwork, don't you? I really do. You go into our new space over in Zumberg, and come on over any time. My office is open. It's pretty good space. And so is the rest of it. But we, we adaptively reused the space very well. But here, what we had is we had the library, the Mary Adam and Pugh Library. Can you imagine one million users in one academic year? I went to some students in the transitions. I said, you know, I didn't see a million students come through in my eight years in Zumberg. Total. <laughs> Probably a third of it at the most. But it's working. It truly is. So what I tell people, it's not just the bricks and sticks we have as much as I'm proud of and the, how we create the environment that's really, in, in fact, through the artwork and others embracing the liberal arts tradition in all that we do, 
But what I say, it's what's happening inside those buildings and in those facilities with our faculty and staff. That is what is really, truly remarkable in my mind. And so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, right now acknowledge the hard work of, uh, of our facilities crew with uh, Jim Bachmeyer and James Moore, Lisa Haynes, and Tim Timish. They do a fantastic job, don't they? And of course, this year wasn't any different than a few years uh, through, the, through my time here. We finished those additions on Asabo Hall. If you want to see a cool place, go over to Kle Kleiner Commons. Wow, that, was, that just opened. And, I, and well, uh, that's all I can say. Go ahead and take a look at it. We had Zumberg Hall. We have the Lake Building. Now, you know, as a result of uh, good thinking ahead, I think James pointed out that because of the, uh, I guess, domino effect, we have the library now full. We have uh, Zumberg now. We pulled back space uh, from the academic uh, arena. We had the equivalent now, uh, a building that was almost 40,000 square feet that going back to academics, to core business. And throughout this time, you know what's really fascinating? Our administrative costs at this university have stayed flat or below inflation in 20 years. Remarkable. Even with uh, you know, these new additions, and, and think of the programs that we have to offer now too, especially in the technical areas with engineering, health sciences, some of the business, uh, you name it. Wow, that's pretty remarkable as well. So what's going on inside of the buildings only, uh, is also there in some of the administrative functions that we have too. And I'm so proud of my, my uh, colleagues and the staff that are always looking for, for ways on how can we make this a little bit better? How can we drive more, more efficiencies and still get the quality and the effectiveness that, that we want? So, and this year is not any different than last. We still have a couple of cranes out on the property with the new laboratory building. First time in 20 years, ladies and gentlemen, that we have support from the state to help us with a building in Allendale. Thanks to Matt and others, that is really great because we're gonna have a relevant program to help us with our investments in the biological sciences. However, when, when Marsha and I were walking past it uh, uh, a few months ago, I'm looking up at it and I say, oh my goodness, is this big. <laughs> but you know it's gonna be filled just like the library Without a doubt, it's gonna help us fulfill the mission and provide those programs that we want for our students. Provide space for you to create and explore, teach and learn. Wow, can't get any better than that. And just because we could, because again, good partnerships, we're gonna have a Laker marketplace that's gonna go open up, I think in April of this year. The laboratory building probably in July, something like that, maybe August. It'll be ready for next academic year. Okay, check. Check that one off. But the Laker Marketplace is going to be open. You know, we don't sell many books anymore. We sell electrons and T-shirts <laughs> and coffee. <laughs> Lots of coffee. But that's, that's going to be a, a great space. And, and the, again, the interaction. That's going to be one of those million-dollar steps I was talking about before. Just think about that. You walk there, you got the, the, got the uh, uh, flags on one side, you got the space over here, you got the Mary Adam of Pew Library and, and just a few st uh, steps ahead. Can it get any better than that if you are an incoming freshman or a returning student or a grad student? Isn't that remarkable? It's because what we do is really have a, a plan. It's called 51550. Some of you may have heard it, many of have, you have not, but it's something I've learned all along the way, that we are always looking at implementing some of the programmatic needs in a five-year window. We have to look at the pro formas. Uh, we'll make sure that we can uh, afford these things, which we, which we do, looking at bonded capacities and the like. And Standard Poor says we're doing pretty good. That's good, because we can, in fact, continue to create these, in, these spaces for relevant programming that's going on. So the next uh, few years, um, well, I think we need to look at, uh, that's in the five-year window now, maybe 10, but five years, look at our living centers because I don't want them to uh, uh, fall into some state of disrepair and irrelevancy. Uh, we do have to look at, uh, I think um, our performance arts and communications, we have to look at the recreational fields, and of course our, our health campus up on the hill. 
This, this is the next five years. And then what we do is, in terms of programmatic needs that we get from the faculty and staff and the deans and the provost cabinet and others with advisory uh, committees, we have to look at the next 15 years. And then Jim knows this because we do it. We want to make sure that these, camp, these uh, buildings have uh, 50 years before we even have to think about, uh, uh, I was on a campus in New York, I think it was like 10. That's not a good place to be. But we're going to build in that quality. That's why I love the fact that we're doing LEED certified buildings. I forget the number right now, but it's probably pushing 20 because of the focus that we have there on sustainability. So we can get it done. And we are. We're doing this uh, together. We're, we're aligning our facilities. We're aligning it with uh, our enrollment. And most importantly, it's all driven by program design. So next, 2021, why did I use that? Well, uh, <coughs> Julia Guevara and uh, her team of uh, folks across the campus are focusing in on 2021 as the next uh, horizon for strategic planning efforts. And the reason why we did that is it's a six year window, it's not the traditional five, is because right in 18, we have our recreditation. Every 10 years at Decennial, we have the uh, Higher Learning Commission coming here, and they're going to peel back every bit of the campus, just like they did in 08. And what they are going to want us to have is a very much a robust, updated strategic plan. And in this case, uh, things do change as well, and think for the better. Assessment and programmatic needs are all going to be driven in this next plan, as well as the reaccreditation efforts as well. But 18. Now 18 is really around the corner. Where's Julie? Julie? Is it 18? It's like tomorrow in your world? Oh, it was yesterday. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that too. And then we have 2021, but I, I think it, it, it will fit because uh, what, what we're going to do is uh, the board will take for action early in 15, put this uh, roadmap in place. I mentioned that the um, Vision statement is turned around very student success oriented, student centered, and the truest sense of that. And so, what we're going to do is really this is the roadmap to our future, and we're going to uh, have each of the divisions and the colleges align their strategic plan to this strategic plan leading us to 2021. So, we have a lot of work to do collectively moving us into that, that direction. And so I, th I think that uh, you're also going to see, and this was, was uh, really good for Julian, we're going to skinny down the number of goals to, I hope, four or five from the eight. We're going to keep them measurable as outcomes. I defined outcomes as measurable results. So we, also, we have to pull in, into the notion that we're going to measure these results. And of course, the strategic plan also helps us allocate our scarce resources, and a sense of priority. And that's why it's, it's so important that we do this. I'm, I, I am a strategic planning guy because that's what you have to do to get to the future that you want. It's not this, any road will take you. No, I want to make sure that we have a road that we can be flexible. Of course, we must be adaptable as well, without a doubt. But we have a set of values in there. We have the mission that's solid, a vision that's solid, and we'll create these outcomes and goals and tactics and all to take us to 2021. Well, aligned with that a little bit, as you know, that I've asked Dr. Wendy Wenner to step in the role of acting uh, VP for inclusion and equity as we continue the search for Dr. Arnold's replacement. Uh, Jean needed to, uh, to leave after seven years uh, with family considerations. And um, she did a great job, in my opinion, setting the foundation for a brand new division and linking their work with the strategic plan. I want to continue that, Wendy. It's very, very important. But I'm, I'm, I've also asked Wendy, in the time that she has, and she, as you know, is a wonderful, wonderful leader. And she sat right at the SMT table from the get-go and started asking relevant questions and perspectives and adding observations and the like. Love it. Well, I want the, her to review the current bias protocol and our policies to ensure, and the practices too for that matter, to ensure a safe place for all to work, live, play, and learn. And for example, this is one of the challenges. 
Sexual assault and violence against men and women will never be tolerated on this campus. Never. All of us, every single one of us, along with our students, need to continue to create that inclusive learning environment. And I mentioned already the tie-in to our reaccreditation efforts. And that's pretty exciting because all this is filling, putting itself into a focus for 2020. And with regards to being on that, uh, that accreditation uh, effort, you said yesterday, but I'm, I'm confident we're going to be ready. You know, to use the Coast Guard again, Semper Paratus, always ready, always prepared, and we will be there as well. But it's going to be a lot on our plate for the next uh, two and a half, three years. So you can see that our plate is full, but I think it's very, very manageable here because we have the time, we have the talent, and we have the resources in place for contingencies. Always build that in, right, Jim? You know that, because we must. We have to be able to adapt. And case of some kind of, of uh, difficulty that we might have. And even if those events are out of control, I want to make sure that we can uh, adapt to those conditions as well. And one of the things that I've noticed here for these last eight plus years is that we never spiral out of control because we always are creating that environment for all of us to succeed truly is the case. So the hallmarks of this institution, of course, I think are flexibility and also the ability to anticipate and adapt. So in closing, Michigan relevant, global impact. Michigan relevant, global impact. These, these are the guideposts ahead. You know, we're, we're about to go into football season. Remember, you have the goalposts? Okay. Well, here you go, Michigan relevant global impact. And we're going to kick a lot through that, without a doubt. <laughs> OK? And that's why we're, we're focusing in on this pathway ahead, with the challenges that we see as well. So we will be managing our resources to the best possible way. And interestingly enough, because of that, our communities that are hosting our campuses are prospering as well. That's really great to hear and see. I'm on some groups in Grand Rapids, but I also see uh, some of our impacts in Traverse City and Muskegon and Holland, Grand Haven, and now even in Detroit. We are going to help the communities, not because we're imposing anything on the communities, but we're there as one of the assets of the community. Our economic impact, for instance, just in the Tri-County region here, not including the alums, even though there's a lot of them, is three quarters of a billion dollars per annum. That's a lot of economic impact. And I think Matt's about 11,000 direct and indirect jobs, something like that. And now we're producing over 5,000 graduates as well. I think it was 5,300 last year. And as you'll see when you check in with Chick's interview with Wood TV, you'll see that many of them are staying right here to pursue careers. And you know, it's interestingly enough, um, we're seeing employers come from out of state, coming over here. Folks from Minneapolis, from Chicago. Right, Troy? It's, it's great to see that. Troy's doing a great job in, in making sure those, those are connections. Disney, a lot of kids going down there, you know? Or, or in Detroit, for instance. I think we have a good number, maybe a dozen or so Quicken Loans all because we're making those, those connections. So employers from other states are also taking notice of our great talent here. So I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with your efforts by preparing qualified graduates, they're going to enable and enhance the professions, of course, and our societies, our mission, of course. And they will have an impact wherever they land, even halfway around the world in Palau, where one of our alums, Tommy Remengasal, I can't say that real well, Remengasal, has been elected president again of his country, second time around. Global impact, Michigan relevant, 
So I think we have momentum. I know that we're leading. I know we're shaping our future. We're involved, I think, in the most exciting and rewarding work imaginable. We touch the future every single day in our classrooms, every time we engage with students, with staff, every time they take GV out with them into the world, we are touching them in many respects. We're touching that future. And I am truly honored to be your colleague in this work. So let's have a grand year and go Lakers. Thank you. I'd like to take, I have a tradition now, even if I ran about five minutes longer than I thought, but I had to do some stories. Um, a question or two before we head on over to convocation. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Facing our students today? Well, if you, you think about this, we're, I'm going to focus in on the undergraduate level first, and then I'm going to talk about the broader perspective. Um, I think uh, there's no doubt um, affordability is very, very important. In fact, uh, in terms of uh, what I saw yesterday in this millennial conference that I went to, that's number five on the list of, uh, of what they see is important to them, not being in so much debt. And so I think it's, it's, uh, that's one thing. I do think that uh, they want to have an education that allows them to be adaptable as well. And this is true. Uh, the uh, younger students we have are going to may maybe see three or four or five different careers. So they want just as what we are providing them, that liberal arts education. Maybe the design thinking is going to be able to help facilitate it as well. So they want something that's very, very relevant for them so they can take it to Grand Rapids, to Chicago, to Beijing, to Kuala Lumpur. I mean, they're going to go all over the world. So I think that that's important. They, they want those skills that we're going to provide them in the, in the liberal arts perspective as well as then in the discipline that's going to distinguish themselves as well. So I think affordability and relevant programming. And I do think that um, the challenge for all of us is to maintain that rigor in our classrooms and outside too because that's, that's what they want. I've mentioned that as well. So um, of course, in our case, access too. You know, we're, we're turning away a lot of students. I, we had 20,000 applications. So we are turning around, uh, turning away a lot of students as well. So um, the millennials wanted college education, even though I think it was probably, maybe because of the recession, there was lots of, of articles uh, saying higher ed is dying because students aren't coming. Well, they, they were more concerned about the immediacy. That's not, gonna turn, that's, that's not the case, I don't think. So I think th those are some of the challenges that are, that are here and see with students. Great question. Right. And we're going to continue to ask them, too. We, we must. If, if we don't, then we're going to go down a pathway that may not serve us. And you know, Chick and, and the enrollment management team is asking that time and again. You know, Jody, Jody and her staff over at Missions really help reflect well who we are because it's, this is, I've said this as well, it's critically important that we fulfill our promises to our students. First time we violate that, it violates our institutional integrity. In some regards, I'm not going to stand for that. I just can't. So we're going to listen to them as well. One more question, please. Yes, ma'am. Come on up so I can hear you. Come on down so I can hear you. Come on down, come on down. Come on down. All right, so what's your name? All right, glad to have you here. Well, it, it's a perfect uh, question, and I think uh, oh, maybe 15 years ago, we were a different campus. We were, I think, a commuter campus in many regards. 
Uh, we are now a residential campus. We had, I think, 6,000 beds right here, maybe another 6,000 across the way on 48th. So we have changed the uh, complexion of the university now being more of a residential. So that means that, first and foremost, the co-curricular activities and engagement with other students is so important. And if we can facilitate that in and outside the classroom, so much better. In fact, many of the co-curricular activities are within the disciplines that we teach. And we can be mentors and role models. I love that role. I'm an educator. I still, I love that role because we're, Every, every year is different because you have every single student with a different story to tell, and they're still telling it, they're still being impacted, and they're going to continue to tell it. So relationships is the most important thing. Get to know your students. Get to know them individually. And if we, when you show that to them, that you're interested in them in an, as an individual, we will make sure that that number goes up. Now, some people will, will attrit because of family conditions. We're going to make sure that financial perspectives aren't one of those issues. You know, <clears throat> I think it's really cool when we were innovative with the grand finish. Familiar with that? We give a thousand bucks. In a way, we were counterintuitive to the rest of the nation. We reduced tuition for a senior. Most schools across the nation will sock it to the juniors and seniors because we got them. We did the opposite thing. We're going to get them out here. In fact, in four years, 32% have no debt if they stay with us, start and stay with us according to stats that Phil Abadi gave to me. Relationships. I love that question because if we can do that, remember we talked about that intimacy? That's what it's all about, that relationship. And we are a different place. Having a, a uh, campus right here as we have, and I'm <coughs> with uh, all the resources we have, making sure that they know where to go because they're young people. Now in terms of uh, relationships with a non-traditional student or a service member, maybe uh, a graduate student as, as well. Again, they all have different uh, needs and desires, so we have to get to know them. I love that question about relationships, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Well, with that, I think I need to go get a robe on, so do others. Let's meet 4,200 new students. How about that? Thank you.